to our fifth and final day of the Virtual Brain Injury Association of North Carolina Camp 2020. My name is Sandy Worthington and I'm the Camp Director. Today I'm so excited we get to go to the North Carolina Aquarium on Roanoke Island. If you have your camp kit, there's a handout in there about sharks. If you don't have a kit, that's okay. You can still download the handout on our camp website, which is Bianc camp2020.net or you can go to the Brain Injury Association of North Carolina's website which is www.biac.net to get it there. So come on and let's go to the beach! Welcome to the North Carolina Aquarium on Roanoke Island. My name is Katie and I'm an educator here at the aquarium. I'm here today to give you a behind the scenes tour of our shark exhibit, also known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic exhibit. As you can see behind me, there are sharks in there and many other fish. This is our largest exhibit here on site. It is 285,000 gallons of homemade salt water. We make our own salt water here in house to make sure that any water that would come from the ocean or the sound didn't have anything growing in it that we wouldn't want to grow out of control here in our really well cared for habitats. We do everything in our power to make sure the water quality, food quality, and quality of life is just wonderful for these animals. What we'll do first is we will talk out front of the exhibit where a visitor would be able to see on regular admission We'll talk about the animals and the habitat, and then we'll go behind the scenes, and we will talk about some storage and some diving equipment downstairs, and then we'll go upstairs and we'll talk about how the aquarist and the dive staff help take care of this habitat and the animals that live in it. Even though we are closed to the public right now, our aquarium is still making sure that all of our habitats and animals are engaged and thriving, and we are offering education programs virtually and outdoors. So we still need to social distance. We're practicing our three W's, waiting six feet away, washing our hands at least 20 seconds, and wearing our cloth face covering. So I'm going to keep mine on in case anyone who is working today should happen by, and I would need to put it back on. All right, so let's get started. Again, this is the Graveyard of the Atlantic, also known as the Shark Exhibit, and it gets that name for a couple of reasons. The Graveyard of the Atlantic is a special nickname for the North Carolina coast, and the North Carolina coast gets that nickname because of all the shipwrecks that you see off of our coast. You can see a replica of one behind me. Off the North Carolina coast, in the sounds and in the rivers, there are over 5,000 known shipwrecks. And we are still finding shipwrecks even to this day because the sandy shoals around North Carolina can uncover or recover some shipwrecks when the wave action or storms take place. The reason we have so many shipwrecks off of our coast, there are a few of them. First, there's the storms. The hurricanes and the nor'easters that we get most years can cause a ship to wreck. Also, it causes that sand to move around. Like I said, we don't have natural reefs here off of North Carolina coast. We don't have rocks, anything that will allow the sand to stay in one place and not move around. So those storms can move the sand, which changes the depth of the water at a certain area. And without sophisticated tools on your ship, you may not know if you're going to run aground. Also, there's been action for pretty major wars, three of them, off of our coast. The Civil War and both World Wars have seen action off the North Carolina coast. This replica is a one-third scale model of the USS Monitor, which was a Civil War ironclad ship. It was one of the first ships that spurred the modern-day Navy. 
That ironclad ship sat most of the way below the water, everything except for the turret, and it was harder to detect and it was harder to sink in cannon fire because of those iron sides. So it's pretty important to our cultural history, but it's also important to the natural history of the North Carolina coast because of what it became after it sank. If you look at it right now, you can see that the exhibits department has put a lot of thought and energy into creating what that shipwreck looks like out in the wild. The ships, after they sink, we found out when this was found, about a hundred years after it sank, it had life bursting from it. So because we don't have anything hard like rocks or coral reefs, here in North Carolina, we end up with what's called an artificial reef. So that shipwreck gives a hard layer for the base of the marine food web. So any kind of soft corals, anemones, sponges, basically your plant layer in a forest ecosystem is what happened on these wrecks. And that base of the food web brought in the higher levels of the food web, brought in the small fish, the medium fish, all the way up to our large predators like our sharks. And if you look at this one here, that is a sand tiger shark. She is the largest animal we have here at the aquarium on Roanoke Island. She's about seven and a half feet and about 250 pounds. She is going over the wreck there, pretty cool. We have three species of sharks here in our habitat. There are the sand tigers. We also have a few sand bars, males and females. Those are the faster ones that are moving behind me. They're smaller than the sand tiger. And we have one more species called a nurse shark who is nocturnal, so he is not always out and about during the day. Right now he's probably taking his snooze in the shipwreck because he can lay on the bottom of the water column and he can pump his gills so that he gets air out of the dissolved oxygen in the water. He can do that and rest in one space, whereas the sand tigers and the sandbars have to swim to breathe. There are hundreds of species of sharks and they have many different adaptations or parts on their body or things they do that help them survive in the wild. And one of the really big ones that most people know about are the teeth. This is a jaw from a bull shark and the bull shark has two different types of teeth. It's got pointy teeth that are kind of skinny and it's got kind of angled teeth that are serrated like a steak knife. And these bull sharks, you can tell what they eat based on how their teeth look. We've got that angled tooth, which is like a can opener, and they can eat sea turtles. And we've got these pointy teeth because they might eat big fish. So telling what an animal eats, you can usually use clues from what their teeth look like. We'll look now at a sand tiger jaw, like our big sand tiger coming back over the shipwreck in just a second. They have teeth that look like fish hooks. And what do we use a fish hook to do? To catch fish. That's what these sharks use their teeth to do. They eat medium sized fish and those hooks help them hold on to them. If you've ever held a fish, you know that it's slippery and it's really strong. So that tooth can get pulled out. Because of that, sharks have another adaptation that we as humans don't get to take advantage of. We get two sets of teeth in our lifetime. Sharks get many more than that. So if that front tooth gets pulled out of the sand tiger's jaw, the tooth behind it, like a conveyor belt, is going to take its place. It's estimated that sand tigers will go through about 30,000 teeth in a lifetime because these medium-sized sharks, they can live about 20 to 25 years in the wild and about 25 to 30 years in human care. In human care, these animals have better food quality, better habitat and water quality, vet care, all of those things can prolong life. Nurse shark jaw, so I mentioned that he lives primarily on the bottom of the water column. He spends a lot of time there. So why not eat the things that also spend a lot of time there? If you look at the nurse shark jaw, you notice that it is flatter teeth. They're closer together. This looks like a nutcracker. This is used for crushing animals with hard shells like crabs, clams, things like that that they find on the bottom, they can crush the shell and get the meat. Along with the shark's teeth are another part of their body that really resembles their teeth. It's their skin. If you watch the shark swim behind me or you look at this shark skin, you'll notice that it looks very smooth. 
but if you've ever felt a shark, it feels like sandpaper, kind of like a cat's tongue, if a cat's ever licked you. And this is why. This is a magnification of a shark's skin. And you can see the tiny scales that they have blown up so that they're visible to the human eye. And they look like pretty sharp scales. They kind of look like teeth. That's how they get the name dermal denticle or skin teeth. And if you look at the anatomy of that shark tooth, shark scale, and a human tooth, they all look really similar because they are. Those dermal denticles are going to break up the water when the sharks are swimming, and that reduces drag and it helps them be faster. Another thing that helps the sharks swim faster and keep their place in the water column is their skeleton. Sharks have a cartilaginous skeleton, so like your nose, or your ears, their skeleton's made of cartilage instead of bone like ours. And that helps them be more bendy. They're harder to break than, say, hard bones like humans. Also, they're going to be lighter. Most fish have what's called a swim bladder. Sharks don't have that. That is a sac inside the fish that they can put air in and out of that's going to help them stay in one place in the water column. Sharks not having this, having a lighter skeleton instead, helps them stay where they want to in the water column. Also, sand tiger sharks, like our large female you keep seeing, are known to go to the surface of the water to gulp air, and they use their stomach as a makeshift swim bladder. Pretty interesting. If you look at these bones, these are backbones from a shark, which are actually cartilaginous. They're not made of bone. Uh, these are really kind of rare to find, so divers find them sometimes, but they break down faster than regular bones, so it's neat if you find one of these guys. So you might see some flakes floating around in the water and this fish eating some things. There was a broadcast feed just a little bit ago, and you're going to see some footage of that in just a moment when we head behind the scenes, but that's just like if you have a fish habitat at home, you'll sprinkle food on top. The aquarists do that for all the small fish as well, but we'll get more into that in just a minute. Let's look at the fish right now that we can see. There is a hogfish back on the ship right there. He's got that long snout. They use that for digging around in the sand. That's how they get the name hogfish. He's pretty fun. So when you dive in this habitat, which we do almost every day to clean, he will eat the bubbles and pull your hair. He kind of likes to interact with the divers. If you see the sheep's head, which are the black and silver striped fish, those have sheep-like looking teeth. That's why they get the name sheep's head. Um, kind of look like human molars. When you're scrubbing in there, if you leave a hand sitting somewhere too long, they'll nibble on your fingers. While some of the smaller fish will interact with the divers, the sharks leave us alone. We don't look, smell, or act like fish, so why would they want to eat us when we don't look, smell, or act like their food? Oh, sometimes they're in the way of the other sharks and they gotta get out of the way really quick. So if we don't smell, act, or look like a shark's food, they're not interested in us. And we don't bother them because we have a you don't touch me, I don't touch you kind of understanding. We don't bother them, they don't bother us. But some of the smaller fish do. Uh, most of the time, a shark attack is a shark mistake. So out of about 50 to 70 shark bites a year in the United States, only about 10% of those are fatal because most of the time, it's actually a mistake. Sharks don't want to eat you. You're not their food. But if you look, smell, or act like their food, they might get confused. Most sharks have vision that's about as good as humans. So when they get in that cloudy water or the sandy water and it's moving around, it's hard to see. So if you look like, say, a sea turtle or a sea lion when you're on a surfboard, you might look like food. If you are splashing around at dawn or dusk when sharks are most, most active, you might be acting like their food. And if you go into the water with bait fish in your pocket, you might smell like their food. If the sharks think that you're their food, they'll take a nibble because they don't have hands to check you out with, they'll do it with their mouth, and if they do that, they're gonna say, ew, this isn't what I want, you're not on my menu, and they're gonna leave you alone. And there goes a sandbar. And you see the permits up top, those silverfish. The bigger, longer ones are Creval Jacks. And the big silver guy that just swam by is called a tarpon. 
All right, let's go ahead and head behind the scenes and check out how we take care of this habitat from day to day. Here we are behind the scenes in the graveyard of the Atlantic and you can see that part of what's behind that habitat there downstairs is storage. We've got some tables and chairs behind me. Those are used for special events and for reservations of the aquarium like weddings, things like that. People can use those things. We've got some exhibit special event storage back here like this Megalodon jaw. But there's a lot of really important pieces back here behind the scenes that is actually for the graveyard of the Atlantic. Behind me, you're gonna see some white PVC pipes coming up and you're gonna see two beige pillars. So these white PVC pipes that you're gonna see all in the ceiling as we walk around down here, that's our water travel. So the SWS, salt water supply, that's water going into the habitat. And then SWR, if you see those letters, that's water coming out of the habitat. The big beige pillars, those are full of what are called bioballs. And bioballs is a kind of filtration, a biological filtration, that is a lot like what's going on inside your own body. You might have heard of probiotics or that a lot of inside your digestive system you have bacteria. That's good bacteria and it helps you break down your food. Same kind of concept here. The bioballs in these pillars are our last defense before the water which I said is made in-house. We make it in the salt building out back, and then it's gonna come through these pipes, through those pillars, and those bio balls are going to pull out any kind of harmful bacteria before that water goes into the habitat. Then the salt water return, SWR, those pipes are taking the water out to be refiltered, or if it is, it has too much gunk in it to be refiltered, it's going to go out of the building. Behind me here, you can see a compression machine. This is what we're gonna take our air, that's just the normal air in the building, and it's what's gonna compress it into one of those cylinders for diving. So we've got some cylinders here that they might do that. It can take basically the amount of air in this entire room and squeeze it into one of those cylinders. In this cage behind me, this is all of our ocean diving equipment. So our dive team might go out on collecting for animals like jellyfish. We might have to go collect some sometimes. They're gonna use that equipment rather than anything else that goes into the other habitats because we don't wanna cross contaminate our habitat water. So anything that goes in the ocean never ever goes inside a habitat in our building. And as we'll see when we get upstairs, GYA has all its own equipment. So everything in that locker is to make sure it doesn't cross contaminate anything inside the building. All right, so that's the downstairs with a lot of filtration and storage and special diving equipment. And now we're gonna move upstairs and see the, the top of the habitat. Okay, folks, you're here at our food prep area, upstairs GYA at the North Carolina Aquarium, graveyard of the Atlantic tank. And this is where we prep all our food for our uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday feedings of the shark tank. Uh, as you can see, I've divided it into uh, different bins over here, and um, each shark has a precise amount of food that is weighed out for them for their feed based on their diet and their body weight. And um, they all have a separate food container that we use, and we actually pull feed them from the surface of the tank. Um, they know when it's feeding time based on a cue that we give them. And uh, today they're getting mackerel, and a fish called Blue Runner. And we actually supplement these fish by putting vitamins in them. Um, they actually make multivitamins for sharks and rays. And so uh, we include that in their diet to make sure they're getting the best nutrition they can get. Um, over here, we have two bins for what's called a broadcast feed. A broadcast feed is for all the other species of teleos fish inside the tank. Uh, obviously, we cannot feed each individual fish when you have hundreds of fish in the exhibit. So we cut up a lot of food, and uh, we've got things in here like krill, sardines, uh, gel food, capelin, squid, and we cut it all up into tiny pieces. And then when we get over to the tank, we distribute it evenly around the tank so all the fish have a chance of getting food. Here we are upstairs at the top of the graveyard of the Atlantic exhibit, where all the food prep happens, where the food is stored for this habitat only, and where the divers get ready to get in and out of the habitat. 
Behind me is the food prep area. And like you saw Britt in, in the video, there is one container per shark as our sharks get specific amount of food based on their weight. Also, that allows us to put vitamins and any kind of medications into the food for the sharks. So we keep all of that stored up here in case we need to give anybody vitamins, minerals, or any kind of medications that goes into their food and keeping it separate and target feeding allows us to make sure the right animal gets that food. Lots of data gets taken when we are interacting with these animals on water quality. Also, there is a board because not everyone wants to work seven days a week. So when someone else is taking care of the habitat, they have instructions. We take very meticulous notes on water quality, on who's eaten, what food is in stock. So we make sure we know what our inventory is. So we never ever run out of food. The food is really high quality for these animals. So they're getting a high quality and variety of food because I don't know about you, but nobody that I know likes to eat the same thing all the time. So in the fridge, we've got some food thawing. There's not a whole lot in the fridge. We don't want to thaw too much and have it go bad. Like Britt probably told you, the sharks eat three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They are offered food. And the other fish are given a broadcast feed five days a week. So there's a lot of different food in the freezer. So let's check that out. Got a lot of food going on in the freezer that gets labeled. We have a variety. So the animals are getting different nutrients and minerals and they're not getting bored with their food. We want to make sure that they're being enriched and engaged and they're eating things they would eat in nature. Close that. You might hear some animals um, splashing around at the top of the habitat. Uh, we keep notes on the animals. So like I said, there's a variety of food and the fish might not always eat. So the sharks in this habitat are cold blooded and they're animals that will tend to eat maybe once a week, maybe once every two or three weeks. So they don't always eat. We offer them more food than they need to stay alive. And like I said, three times a week. So we might eat three to five times a day. They don't have to eat that much. So if they're not eating as often as we'd like them to, we can keep track of what their favorite foods are. Uh, we can see that the uh, sand tiger is preferring mackerel and herring. So if that animal hasn't eaten in maybe a feed or two, which is not a huge deal, we can still give them something to entice and make sure they're getting a food that maybe they really enjoy. Like I mentioned, we have targets and you saw in Britt's video, this is the target for the sand tiger sharks. And that target goes in there after that sound that you saw in the video. And that allows the sharks to know this is where I'd like you to go to get your food. So it's positive reinforcement. That shark goes to that target. And what that means is I've done what you asked. Now you're going to give me some food. So the aquarists give those sharks food at that point to say, good job, please do it again. So when they get the target in there, that's when the shark knows where to go. That allows us to make sure we know who's eating, how much they're eating, what they're eating, they got their medicine. And also vets can get a good look at the shark without having to go into the habitat and do that from that side. Like I said, this is also where we store our dive gear and when we get ready to dive, when we go into the habitat. Um, the water is always in the 70s, so we have to wear wetsuits so we don't get cold. Um, there are different thicknesses depending on how cold each diver's body runs. So they wear those and they don't get cold. They're in there for about an hour, give or take, depending on how much air they use. They have a buoyancy compensator device or a BCD. I mentioned swim bladders earlier. This is what the diver uses to keep themselves in one place in the water column. It's how we stay in one place with our buoyancy. This is the regulator. That's what the diver uses to attach to their air cylinder and goes into their mouth. So that's how we get our air. Right now there's less gear here than normal because with the COVID pandemic, we are only allowing some divers and each diver has their own gear. Make sure that there is no chance of spreading a virus that way. This is a special mask we use for our dive shows. Uh, that mask is called a full face mask and the air goes right in the front and that allows the diver to talk to us and we can talk to them with a special microphone out front of the exhibit. Here we have all our emergency um, 
procedure gear. So every diver is trained in CPR, first aid, AED. In case there was ever an emergency, they would know what to do. Like I said, this is a big habitat, 285,000 gallons of water. That means there's a lot of cleaning. So we have a lot of cleaning material, sponges. We have to scoop sand sometimes, keep it out of the filters. And we've got a scrub, lots and lots of algae. We do that usually two times a day. There are divers getting in to clean this habitat and make sure it doesn't get ahead of us. have the acclimation pool. So the acclimation pool has a few different things that it is used for. This is where the divers will get in and out of the habitat. There's what's called a torpedo tube that connects this acclimation pool to the other side here, which is the actual habitat. So the divers get in and out there. And it also is what it sounds like its name is, it's for acclimating fish. So just like you might with a fish you have at home, when you bring it from you know, the pet store, you have to acclimate it to your habitat before you can just toss it in there. Same thing here, we have to acclimate these animals to the water, the different pH levels, the temperature, all of that, maybe the salinity. But there are already, like I said, many animals in the habitat and we have to acclimate them to each other. So think if something just randomly popped up in the middle of your living room, it might be really interesting to you. What is this, where to come from, what's it doing here? Same thing with these animals. They are too interested in that animal, which can cause negative interactions or stress on that animal, which we don't want. So we have these special barriers that we'll put over that torpedo tube. And this allows the fish in the habitat already and the fish in the acclimation pool to see each other. They can see each other, interact with one another without physically interacting. And that way they get used to each other and it's kind of old news by the time that barrier is removed and that animal can go in and out of the habitat and into the acclimation pool as it pleases. This is footage of our Goliath grouper who came from quarantine, is being acclimated to the Graveyard of the Atlantic exhibit. You can see her being target fed by some of our aquarists in front of that fencing there that separates her from the rest of the habitat. And then we are going to move on to above the habitat. And here at the close of our tour, we will stop and just watch for a minute over the top of the graveyard of the Atlantic exhibit and see the fish swimming around. We can see some sandbar sharks coming back and forth there. There are some permits out in the middle those silver with the black tails. If you see the stripes in the water, those are the sheep's head. There goes another sandbar. And here at the North Carolina Aquarium on Roanoke Island, we would just like to thank you folks for coming on our behind the scenes tour. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope that you get to come visit us when we reopen to the public. Katie for that behind the scenes shark exhibit tour. That was really cool. We hope that you will get to go visit the North Carolina aquariums in person soon. This week of camp has been really fun and we hope that you enjoyed it. Our plan is that we will be in person for our annual Beyond Camp next year. But in the meantime, please go to the Brain Injury Association of North Carolina's website. That's www.biac.net 
to find out about our upcoming Bianc virtual conference that will be on November 17th, 2020. Thank you for being at camp with us. Stay safe, stay well, and we hope to see you next year at our annual Bianc camp. Bye. Thank you.